Good morning from Fort City, Pennsylvania. This is Chuck King on Monday, December 13, 2021, bringing you a morning Bible study. And we're continuing our study in the, the teaching of the first century apostles to see and to compare how their teaching uh, relates to our teaching and the way we function in the church. And I think if you are honest and and sincere about seeking the will of the Lord, you will see that the first century church operated much differently than our churches do today. Therefore, we should make corrections to bring our churches back to the New Testament pattern. We're going to look at 1 Corinthians 12 beginning in verse 1 today. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware or ignorant or uninformed. Talking about the word here is spiritual, so that, that those anointings that come directly from the Holy Spirit, we call them gifts, but the word gifts isn't in the Greek. It's describing the supernatural anointings that come from the Lord to the body of Christ and to different members of the body of Christ. And Paul says, I don't want you to be ignorant or unaware, untaught. And uh, there are many, many people today that don't really know anything about the gifts of the Holy Spirit as the New Testament teaches about them. Verse 2, you know that when you were pagans or unbelievers, you were led astray to the mute idols, however you were led. So idolatry is pointed out here as the motivation, being led by a false spirit, demonic entities to worship idols. Verse 3, Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God, by the Holy Spirit, says, Jesus is accursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Now, of course, we know that Paul means no one can really mean those things said by their words unless the Holy Spirit is guiding them. You can't, you can't really confess Jesus Christ as Lord unless the Holy Spirit is guiding you, and you can't curse Jesus, blaspheme him uh, by the Holy Spirit. It's impossible. When we know that people can say most anything, but we're talking about the motivation here. One person who is led by the Spirit, another person who is not, by the fruit of their words. Verse 4, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. Again, the word gift is used here in the English translations. A variety. There are different gifts. I, I count as many as 20 throughout the New Testament mentioned in these lists from 1 Corinthians 12 and 14 and from Romans 12. And also we have the gift of celibacy mentioned by Paul in 1 Corinthians 7. So when I count them up, I get around 20 different spiritual gifts mentioned specifically in the New Testament. But it's the Holy Spirit who is the motivation for these gifts. You can't be gifted without the Holy Spirit gifting you. It's not something natural, something that you can develop on your own by going to school or by practical uh, understanding. It's a supernatural grace gift that God gives. Verse 5, And there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. So not only are there a variety of gifts, but there are a variety of ministries, different kinds of callings to minister to people. But it's it's the same Lord. It's it, Jesus is the one who gives and calls uh, people to do certain things, whether it's gifts of the Spirit or ministries they're called to. 
There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. So the effects or the outcomes of the gifted ministries have different uh, different varieties uh, of of outcomes or effects, but it's the same God. So we even have in these two verses uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit mentioned here as the uh, author of the gifts and the ministries and the effects of the ministries and the gifts. Verse 7, but to each one, verse 7, but to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. So we have an indicator here that every believer, every disciple is given a manifestation uh, or a gift of the Spirit the grace gift of God for for what? For their selfish reasons? No, for the common good means for the for the good of the whole church. That's why God gives us gifts and ministries and uh, works through us is to build up the whole church. Verse eight, for to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. Now again we're talking about what's going on in the common group or the, the entire group, the church. Not a building, but the gathering of disciples. So the first gift mentioned is the word of wisdom. Second is the word of knowledge, according to the same spirit, to another faith, by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing, by one spirit, to another the effecting of miracles, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing or discerning of spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, and to another the interpretation of tongues. So we have, there, there are nine gifts mentioned here, wisdom, knowledge, faith, gifts of healing, more than one, miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, tongues, and interpretation. This is not an exhaustive list, but these are nine of the gifts mentioned out of a, a roughly 20 that I've discovered throughout the New Testament. And these are the gifts that, to me, obviously are to be used in the, the body of Christ for the common good, for the good of the whole body. So <clears throat> when the Lord gives me wisdom, it's to build up someone else, or knowledge, the same, faith, the same, gifts of healing, same thing, miracles, prophecy, uh, discernment of spirits, tongues and interpretation, all these things are to be used for the common good, not just for my good, but for the good of all. Verse 11, but one and the same spirit works all these things distributing to each one individually just as he wills. So it's not the will of man that manifests the gifts of the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit who works in each one of us and distributes the gifts and ministries and effects among the body of Christ just as he wills. The Lord is the head of the church, not man, not man's scheduling, not man's promotions, not man's abilities. And this is where we've really gone off the rails. Our churches are not led by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit does not direct every member of the body in their, in their variety of gifts and ministries and effects. We see men taking control and even to the point of scheduling every moment of the service, how can the Holy Spirit lead and direct the members of the body of Christ in, in that kind of environment? And that's, this is why I believe from the New Testament we see a strong argument for small groups, small groups of believers who could all minister during a gathering of, of the believers or during a church service, as we call it, when the disciples come together. Every member could be led by the Spirit to be used in their, their uh, gifts and their ministries and the effects of the Lord 
manifested among that group if it was small. And one of the reasons why we, we schedule everything out to the last minute is the groups are too large. And, and the meeting would go on and on and on and on if everybody could participate like the New Testament teaches we should. Verse 12, For even as the body is one and yet has many members, and all the members of the body, though they are many, are one body, so is, also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and we were all made to drink of one spirit. So we see the, the direction of the Holy Spirit manifesting these gifts and ministries and effects. We have one body, even though we have many members. And that's, that's taught here as doctrine. There's one body, not um, multiple thousands, as we have denominations and, and divided organizations around the world. But one body, the Spirit directing the body of Christ. Christ is one. He's not divided. Even though there are many members, there's only one body with Jesus as the head. And verse 13 tells us it's the Holy Spirit that baptized us into this one body. No matter where we come from, what our ethnicity is, our nationality, our culture, the Holy Spirit is the one who puts it all together and directs the activity in the church. Now, that's just not so around the world. I've been around the world and the Holy Spirit is not in charge of the church as described here. We are divided and broken, even in local churches, so that the Lord, I'm sure he's grieved by, the, the Holy Spirit is grieved by us not allowing him to direct the church and the members as he desires. Verse 14, for the body is not one member, but many. There it is again talking about one body with many members. If the foot says, because I'm not a hand, I'm not part of the body, is it not for this reason any less a part of the body? If the ear says, because I'm not an eye, am I not a part of the body? Is it not for this reason any the less a part of the body? The answer is no. Just because you're the foot and not the hand, just because you're the eye, and not another member of the body, that doesn't make you any less a part of this body. You're one of the members, important members, in this functioning one body of Christ. Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? We've got to have this variety of different members and gifts and ministries and effects functioning in the church, it's not all the same, not one focus. The Holy Spirit has, has a way of directing all these different members and ministries and effects in the same gathering of believers. Look at verse 18. But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body just as he desired. You see that? It's the will of God that determines the gifting and the ministries and the effects in the body of Christ. It's not men, yet that's what we're doing. We're allowing people, people are determining what gifts are functioning and what happens in the, um, the, the, the body of Christ in their meetings, their church services. Verse 19, if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members but one body, so that's emphasized over and over again. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor. And our less presentable members become much more presentable, whereas our more presentable members have no need of it. So he's describing like a human body has private members to it. It has open public members to it. 
They're all important. We can't consider one more honorable or one more important than the other. And we know this by, if you ever break a toe, you realize how important a toe is to your whole body. That's just one illustration. We need all the members of the body healthy and functioning. And the Holy Spirit is to be the one who directs the members of this one body. Verse uh, verse. For 24 again, but whereas our more presentable members have no need of it, but God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacks, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. See how what koinonia is, what intimate fellowship is, a working together. Every member doing its part according to the New Testament doctrine so that the whole body would be edified. God doesn't want division to be in the body, but that every member would care for the other. Because, according to this doctrine, if one member suffers, everyone suffers. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice. We are all in this thing together as individual disciples, members of the body of Christ. And the Holy Spirit needs to orchestrate the gifts and the ministries and the effects of that gathered group of believers. And this is God's plan. This is God's will. You want to know what God's will is? You should. He wants the body to function this way. Is it? No. Not even in the house churches I've seen and been part of. We still lack this maturity of every member functioning. And only the Holy Spirit can correct this. But we have to be willing to adjust and change according to the Scripture, not according to the teaching of men. Verse 27, Now you are Christ's body and individually members of it. Now we're not talking about a human body. That's the metaphor illustration. We're using the body human body is an illustration, but we're really talking about Christ's body, his total membership, individual members that make up one church. Verse 28, and God is appointed in the church. That doesn't mean in a building that the word church is ecclesia, the gathering of disciples. When the, when the gathering of disciples happens or the church meeting happens, when we say church meeting, we mean a gathering of believers, not a building. The location doesn't define us. Christ in us defines us. In that gathered body of believers, in the church, God has appointed. Here's a priority listing. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. And this seems to be the teaching from Ephesians 4. When we talk about those gifted ministries that equip the body of Christ to bring them to maturity so they are no longer wavering like the, the wind and the waves of the sea, but come together under the lordship of Christ, every member doing its part. It's the same message here that we need first apostle, prophets, and teachers. And we have really gone away from this standard in the body of Christ. Who are the apostles, prophets, and teachers? They're, they're, uh, they're out there. The gifting must be out there. The Holy Spirit still gifts people in these areas. But we have, we have this model uh, in our churches where there's a senior pastor. We've, we've put everything on the senior pastor title, the head pastor, the executive pastor, we call them sometimes. But we, we are lacking these apostles, prophets, and teachers to bring the church to maturity. Now look here. Then miracles, gifts of healings, helps administration, various kinds of tongues. So uh, where if you would ask me in the natural, what would be the most important gifts? I would probably respond miracles and gifts of healing. But they're not. They're down on the list after apostles, prophets, and teachers, even though all these gifts are important. There's a priority listing here for the purpose of the function 
of the Spirit in the body of Christ in the church meetings. Then Paul asks a series of questions. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healings, do they? All do not speak in tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? Meaning that not everyone has the, all these gifts or the same gifts. There, there should be some apostles. There should be prophets. There should be teachers and workers of miracles and gifts of healings and tongue speakers and those who interpret the tongues. Those should all be in the gathering of believers. But they're not all the same. That's the message here. God places his priority list and his giftings in the church, and he directs their gifts and ministries and effects. That's what this chapter is teaching us. But the final verse here, but earnestly desire the greater gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. Of course, that's the way of love in the next chapter. But we are to earnestly desire the greater gifts. And day by day, I have to admit to myself as I examine myself, and I, I think almost all of us are in the same category, that we do not earnestly desire the greater gifts. The greater gifts would be the apostle, prophets, teachers, miracles, healings. Those are the top, top ones. Do we desire the greater gifts? If we desire them, that means we should be seeking after them. We should be seeking the Lord to manifest his gifting, his order, his, his agenda in the body of Christ. But what are we doing? What's the fruit of what we're doing? We just keep doing the same things over and over again. We have, a, we have an order to our service, a plan for our local churches, and it doesn't look <clears throat> like chapter 12. If you're honest, if you examine yourself and your church, you will see that it doesn't look like chapter 12. And these are the, the reasons why I'm teaching and repeating and going back over these things. Because God is calling us to obedience. He's calling us to action. He's calling us to the doctrine of the New Testament. Not our own ideas or the teachings of men or culture or tradition. And I'm trying to get the church to wake up among the nations to realize that these kinds of teachings, like in chapter 12 of 1 Corinthians, are foundational to the body of Christ. And yet we basically ignore them. Yes, we talk about them, but we're not seeking the Lord to give him the 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 leadership of our churches so that this kind of ministry can take place again. There are those who say that these gifts don't operate anymore. And I say to you, if you believe that, where is your biblical evidence? You have none. The New Testament teaches that these gifts are of the Holy Spirit and they ought to be operating by leadership of the Holy Spirit in our churches. Now the problem is we've got so much unbelief and so much error among us in the body of Christ that it's my opinion that the Holy Spirit is grieved and he is not pouring out his grace like he wants to upon those who are diligently seeking him in humility. And <clears throat> this was the frustrating the thing for me, I look around and see the desperate needs of brothers and sisters that I truly know and love, physical, emotional, uh, material needs in their lives that are going unmet. And uh, we have prayer warriors lifting those needs up. And yet we see so little, so little answers to our prayers this ought to concern every one of us why are our prayers hitting hitting the heavens like they are brass like the old prophet would say why are they bouncing off 
it seems like we're not getting answers. I believe this is part of it. I don't have all the answers, but I see that unbelief caused Jesus not to be as effective as he was at other times. The unbelief of, not his unbelief, but the unbelief of the people around him sometimes affected the outcome of the ministry among those people. He could not or would not do miracles because of their unbelief. Remember what Jesus said, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? I think we're in a desperate time where the church has become so used to operating and functioning according to men that we have stopped relying on the move of the Spirit. And so the Holy Spirit it says, okay, you want to do it? Go ahead. But I'm not, I'm not in this. And as a result, we don't see the supernatural like we should be seeing. Okay, this is what the church taught. We should be teaching it. We should be seeking the Lord to live like this. We'll talk to you tomorrow. God bless.